Kleptocrats, dictators, and oligarchs strip their country's resources and pocket the money, while their kids live the most lavish party lifestyles abroad with pop stars and Michael Jackson's glove. We're here to break down how the rich live above the law, set up systems to do it, and fuck over the rest of us. Welcome to Offshore. Today, we're on the coast of Africa, where many countries are dealing with the consequences of corruption. Corrupt leaders around the world love to use their political power to take their country's wealth via bribes, kickbacks, or simply diverting government funds into their personal pockets. All at the expense of their own people. These dicks are known as kleptocrats, and the officer plays a key role in helping these kleptocrats stay rich along with their kids, the kleptobrats. But what are these lavish lifestyles that these asshole offspring are living? Do they get away with it? Something you quickly see when you look at these kleptocrats around the world. They rule with violence, strip their country's resources, and pocket the money that should have gone to the public good and development of their country. Then they look around at what they've done to their country and go, yuck. They decide that this is no place for their klepto kid to grow up. Gross. Ugh. They send them off abroad for their education, fancy schools and fancy places. So let's see where some of these loving klepto moms and dads drop their klepto children off at school. Before he was Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un was the son of Supreme Leader Kim Jong-il. As a kid, he went to school in Switzerland at the International School of Bern. Because yeah, dude, staying in North Korea would have been totally not supreme. Remember where you came from, a family that pushes illicit activities like human trafficking to fund our luxury ski resort. Chinese President Xi Jinping sent his daughter to Harvard, just like notoriously corrupt CCP party member Bo Xi Lai's Playboy son. He reportedly lived in a luxury apartment and drove an $80,000 Porsche. I take the bus. And how about those Russians? Putin press secretary Dmitry Peskov's daughter once said Russia's education system is a true hell. I wonder who could fix that. And her dad. This Instagramming socialite went to school in Paris and says she's a self-made woman. She also said US sanctions in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine are unfair. Maybe we should listen to her because she's been literally educated in unfairness. Sergei Lavrov, Putin's foreign affairs minister, that's Mr. We didn't even attack Ukraine and Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis and drug addicts. Anyway, he sent his daughter to Columbia in New York City. Lavrov's stepdaughter from his other unofficial wife went to Imperial College and bought a $5.8 million apartment in London when she was 21, according to recent sanctions opposed against her. Honestly, you're not cool unless you have sanctions against you. So what do these kleptobrats actually do with their degrees? Well, Saif al-Islam, son of infamous Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, went to college in London, and he went on to brutalize his citizens. The Crown Prince of Bahrain went to college in the US and UK, and he went on to brutalize his citizens. Bashar al-Assad, Nepo baby dictator of Syria, spent time training in London as an eye doctor. Can you read those back to me? To look better at one or two. Fuck, like, don't, don't worry. I'm gonna go and brutalize my citizens. So how else do these bookworms spend their expensive time? You know the MTV show, My Super Sweet 16, where the rich throw insane parties for their children's 16th birthday, and some of them cry because they get a blue Mercedes instead of a black Mercedes like they asked for? Well, that's the parties hedge fund managers and rappers throw for their kids. Let me tell you about the kind of parties the klepto brats get. They make that over-the-top bar mitzvah you went to look like utter shit. You hear that, Jake? Your sweets table in Air Force One painting station sucked. Everybody thought it was super uncool, unimpressive. Everyone hated it. Isabel Dos Santos, daughter of Angola dictator Jose Eduardo Dos Santos, once brought Nicki Minaj out to Angola to perform for $2 million. Nicki Minaj posted on her Instagram with Isabel, noting that she's supposedly the eighth richest woman in the world, saying, girl power, this motivates me so much. Get your own. Nothing says girl power quite like looting your country's oil industry to the tune of $3.5 billion, making you the richest woman in Africa, while half your country lives on less than $2 a day and has the 16th worst life expectancy in the world. Yeah, get your own Interpol arrest warrant for embezzlement, fraud, influence peddling, and money laundering. Mariah Carey also performed for the Dos Santos family in 2013. Makes sense, we all love Mariah Carey's holiday single, all I want for Christmas is Angolan oil money. Sir Elton John performed with Kazakhstan's then dictator's son-in-law's birthday for 1.5 million. And Nelly Furtado reportedly performed for the dictator's daughter. And Kanye West performed at the wedding of his grandson for $3 million. And there's the biggest music lovers in the klepto brat world, the sons of Muammar Gaddafi. One of them paid Beyonce $1 million to perform at his New Year's Eve party in St. Bart's. 
He also had Usher, Jay-Z, Russell Simmons, and John Bon Jovi in attendance. The Gaddafi family has also had Mariah Carey, Lionel Richie, 50 Cent, and Nelly Furtado put on shows for them. Nelly Furtado plays for every dictator. I think every dictator said Nelly Furtado. To be fair, what pop star hasn't performed for a family has blown up a commercial airliner, killing 270 people. Then there's Equatorial Guinea's now Vice President, Teodora Nguema Obiang, our boy, Teddy. A man accused of massive corruption by governments around the world and the son of the world's longest serving ruler. Teddy's dad has a four decade run as the country's dictator. And this guy parties. In 2018, Teddy had Ludacris, Akon, Jeezy, Sean Kingston all perform at his birthday party. This is a video of Luda at the party that Teddy posted. Everybody that's born in Africa, make some noise if you're born here. Yeah, make some noise if you're part of the roughly 45% of Equatorial Guinea's population that has a safe and reliable water source, or the 51% that has access to proper sanitation. Yeah, all right. So let's look a little more at Teddy. The Obiangs are a great combo. A father willing to rule brutally and exploit his own nation for financial gain and a son willing to live the most obnoxiously extravagant lifestyle possible. So first, how did the Obiangs get so powerful? Daddy Teodoro took over Equatorial Guinea in 1979, leading a coup against his own uncle and executing him at his infamous Black Beach prison. Cool family, man. Later, Equatorial Guinea struck black gold. They found oil, their GDP jumped, but that money wasn't going to the people of Equatorial Guinea. That windfall was for one family only. Like any good kleptocrats, they didn't want to spend that new money in their own country. P.U. Gross. They wanted to spend that cash in America and Europe. This is where the infamous Riggs Bank comes in. Riggs Bank was the most important American bank you've never heard of. A lot of US presidents banked there. You could see it on the back of the original $10 bill. It loaned the US government money to fight the Mexican-American War, the purchase of Alaska, and funded the invention of the telegraph. Riggs set up tons of accounts for the Obiangs and set up shell corporations in the Bahamas for them. Riggs just did everything for them before it all came crashing down after 9-11. And one of the few examples of the offshore getting punished in America, Riggs Bank eventually folded under pressure from Senate investigations and huge fines. RIP to this OG corrupt institution. Bless up to the bankers in the sky. So 9-11 and its regulatory aftermath, like the Patriot Act, brought in strict regulations around money laundering and banking, seemingly ruining the Obiang's sweet little offshore setup. I almost forgot, we're in the fucking offshore and the rich always come out on top. All it took was a few industries to lobby for loopholes and get temporary exceptions to post 9-11 money laundering regulations. Things like real estate, escrow accounts, private equity management, hedge funds, luxury cars, private jets, and auction houses. That list of exemptions was like an offshore playbook to setting up a playboy life in the USA. And Teddy is the kleptobrat playboy. In the 2000s, Teddy was living in his Malibu palace that he bought for $30 million, a 15,000 square foot mansion with a golf course, tennis courts, and two pools with spectacular Pacific views. Teddy owned at least 32 sports cars. And one time he apparently parked his Bugatti near a club saw onlookers admiring it, and sent his driver home to bring another Bugai that he could park next to it so he'd have two Bugais to show off. Two, what? Two of them? Damn, I gotta get like this, ugh. He owned high performance speed boats and a Gulfstream 5 jet he bought through a shell company. He dated models and the rapper E. He went through a party for her on a yacht he rented for $700,000. He got a German boat builder to draw up plans for a 200 foot custom yacht that would have a shark tank on board, a movie theater, and fingerprint operated doors, all for just $380 million. Can you make this for me? And I want the shark on the boat. But remember the cardinal rule of the offshore, keep a low profile, don't be too loud. This guy was loud. His life was the most lavish, insane life you can possibly imagine. Except he made it even insaner. Urgh. Teddy was obsessed with Michael Jackson and with dirty money burning in his pocket, he decided to become the planet's largest collector of Michael Jackson memorabilia. He bought an MTV Moon Man Award, the gold record from Beat It, a basketball signed by both Michael Jackson and Michael Jordan, an autographed red jacket from the Thriller music video, life-size statues of Michael that he put around his Malibu mansion, and the grand prize for $160,000, he bought the famous white crystal covered glove.
Remember the exemptions in the Patriot Act? One of them is in the auction industry. They essentially have no obligation to look into where their money comes from or who's buying overpriced Michael Jackson memorabilia. So all Teddy had to do was get his secretary to do the bidding in person, transfer the money over from Equatorial Guinea, and ask the auction houses not to put his name on anything. Michael Jackson's stuff is in the hands of a smooth criminal, but not too smooth. ICE, a US government organization mostly known for deporting illegal immigrants, has a department dedicated to anti-corruption. It basically exists to stop kleptocrats running their money through America. And this anti-corruption team was looking for an example case. All of Teddy's flaunting in the tabloids led them to his boat purchases. Hey, excuse me, you seen this guy around? And then very soon, they also found out about the Michael Jackson memorabilia and the glove. So in October 2011, ICE and the Department of Justice went after Teddy and his assets. Teddy's lawyer said, okay, we won't take any of these assets out of the US while we all sort of figure this out. Teddy reportedly sent one of his staff to Malibu with one job, get as much Michael Jackson memorabilia out of the country and into Equatorial Guinea. He also took anything that wasn't nailed down, most of his cars and his jet. Two days later, his guy flew to Equatorial Guinea, taking with him the most famous glove in the world. Kleptocrats like the Obiangs use their power to exploit their country, taking money that could help their people and spending on themselves and their kids. So what happened with Teddy? He's a VP in his country now. He's jet setting and yachting and posting everything on Instagram. And actually in 2014, he posted a lot of photos of Michael Jackson memorabilia, including the white glove. Are the kleptocrats the bad guys of this story? Sure. But America is also complicit for leaving these loopholes wide open for them to send their dirty money through. Equatorial Guinea's vast oil reserves are almost exclusively tapped by American oil companies that make tremendous profits. Then all the money from the country's natural resources go to one corrupt family that spends it all on luxury goods in America. In 2009, a diplomatic cable from the US embassy in the country advised that the door is wide open for the US to exercise significant influence and push the aging president to institute democratic reforms. They said, after all, we, via the US oil companies, pay all their bills, and the Equatorial Guinea leadership knows it. The US talks a big game about all the money lost in the offshore to Switzerland and the Cayman Islands, but for the rest of the world, the offshore is the good old USA. The US is the offshore now. It used to be Switzerland, then it was the Caymans and the islands and all that, the offshore. Now it is the USA. That's what's happening. That's what I'm trying to get across in this episode right now. We were the offshore the whole time? That was offshore. I'll see you on the beach next week. Oh, shit. I can't light this thing in the studio. I'll get fucking fired. <laughs>